Hi, my name is Layla Felder. I'm 17 years old and I'm an avid art lover. Come join me as I talk with artists and curators about their art, their processes, and what makes them tick. Because we are in conversation. Perfect. Nice. <laughs> Seriously, it was just sitting there? Well, the guy uh, who owns the barbershop had these chairs sitting in the back. Like, they got new chairs. And he was getting ready to get rid of these. And I was like, let me have them. artist and I don't know how long it's been since I met you but like I met you when I was like 10-ish. Yes, I, I feel like I've known you all your life. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I'm here in a studio which is beautiful and smells fantastic. <laughs> so it's true, it does. It does. Artist studios always smell great. I feel like artists usually burn incense or mm -hmm. you know, something like that and so it's it's like it's nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, I, I, I try to keep nice smells around you. <laughs> think. Yeah. So, um, did you always want to be an artist? The only thing I've ever wanted to be is an artist. Yeah. Uh, when I was a little boy, uh, four or five years old, like my favorite show to watch was Good Times, mm -hmm. and my favorite character on Good Times was JJ, and mm -hmm. he was an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, uh, I talk about this. Uh, Quite frequently, in popular culture, in American popular culture, I cannot think of another black male character mm -hmm. that was a visual artist outside of JJ. In television, in film, I can't think of another. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's actually very true. I mean, on Blackish now, I mean, but he's in he's in advertising, right. but no, actually. And so even yeah, like Boomerang, you have. You know, Marcus was in advertising. Yeah. Like an artist, like a visual artist. I can't yeah. think of another example. Uh, and so when I think about that, I, you know, I'm always humbled by the impact mm -hmm. that that character had on me. Because I deliberately wanted to be an artist like him. Mm -hmm. You know, they lived in the ghetto. I lived in the ghetto. Mm -hmm. You know, they were poor. I was poor. You know what I mean? But mm -hmm. I liked to draw it in JJ. You know what I mean? So I had identified yeah. with that that character. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've always wanted to be an artist. That's the only thing I've ever wanted to be. When I was nine years old, uh, we had this reading segment that we had to do and it talked about um, animation mm -hmm. or animators, uh, specifically Charles Schultz, who does the Peanuts, like Charlie Brown. Ah, Brandon. there we go. Um, and, and before that time, you know, I hadn't heard that term animation before, mm -hmm. or animator before. Uh, and mind you, like I said, I was living, you know, we, I lived in the projects, I grew up in the projects, and uh, uh, we didn't have a lot of books and things in my house, but we did have this set of encyclopedias from like 1969 mm -hmm. uh, that I used to read all the time, you know, like I just, because uh, th those are my two things. I wanted to be an artist and I wanted to be in the encyclopedia one day. Those are okay. my goals in life. I like that. Um, and so, 
uh, after I read about, you know, learned about animators, or read about animators in the sting, I ran home that day uh, and I grabbed the A encyclopedia and I looked up animator and he said, look up cartoonists, you know, go to see, look up cartoonists. Mm -hmm. And mind you, before this, people used to always say, when I told them I wanted to be an artist, they'd be like, oh, you have to be a starving artist or you'll be dead before you get any, you know, money, you know, kind it's of really thing. really optimistic, that's right. just support. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I was like, man, that's whack, I'm already skinny enough, I don't want to be starving, <laughs> you know. Uh, but anyway, I looked up cartoonists and I read everything it said about cartooning. And there was one line in there that said, a cartoonist can make up to $1,000 a week, right? And mind you, I'm nine years old at this time, I'm like, man, they're making $1,000 a week in 1969, carry the one. They must be making a lot more now, that's what I'm gonna be. Uh -huh. So from the age of nine up until I got to college, you know, I, I specifically wanted to be an animator. Mm -hmm. um, and so everything that I did was about animation. Like I studied everything in animation. Mm -hmm. uh, I made up my own characters, I made my own comic books. I would Xerox them in the library before school and sell them at lunch in the cafeteria, oh. you know what I mean? Like I was very, very, focused on, you know, being an artist by yeah. entire life. Yeah. Man, you gotta think of like a plan. Yeah. Do you have any of the, like, of your old cartoons? Somewhere, yes. Yeah, somewhere. I would be so curious to yeah. see. And so then, did you go to art school? I did. Did yeah. you go for cartooning or for? I did, yeah. Uh, um, uh, when I was graduating from high school, I started applying to programs, like animation programs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the main one that I was considering was actually the Art Institute of Atlanta that had an animation program. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't really look at any schools or anything else other than animation. I knew what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Like I was going to be the Black Walt Disney. That was my, my goal. Yeah. Uh, and I had recently won a art competition, like a statewide art competition. Mm -hmm. And one day, this guy showed up at my high school uh, from the Atlanta College of Art. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, we saw your work and we we're really interested in talking to you about coming to Atlanta College of Art. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, you know, I was considering going to the Art Institute because I want to major in animation. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, you could do that at the Art Institute, but it's a two year school, you'll get an associate's degree. But if you come to Atlanta College of Art, mm -hmm. you'll get a BFA, which mm -hmm. is a more, uh, uh, more hefty yeah. degree, it's a four year school, mm -hmm. and you'll get exposed to the fine arts as well. Mm -hmm. I'm like, the what? Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, I don't know what that was. Uh, but, you know, he was like, we also do some animation stuff, so you could do that there, mm -hmm. you know, so, and we'll give you a scholarship. And I was like, ping, I'm there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, that's how I ended up here in Atlanta, uh, at the Atlanta College of Art. And, uh, you know, first day of school, very first class. Very first thing the professor said changed everything that I had planned. What did he say? He walked up to the board and he wrote, "What is art?" <laughs> I had never once considered that question. Yeah. You know, uh, and I remember people, you know, gave responses and answers for what they, you know, thought art was. You know, and and I listened to what people had to say, but I was like, oh, I don't think that's quite it. Like it, it didn't. Settled with me. Uh, in my entire four years at Atlanta College of Art, was was searching for the answer to that question. Yeah. That is. I, I love. I love that. That was the because it's it is when you think about it. Like, what is art? Oh yeah. You wouldn't even try to answer it. It's like because well, mm -hmm. right. it's art is not. It's a, kind of like a viscous thing. It can kind of be anything depending mm -hmm. on your perspective. And so when did it transition from um, animation to fine art? Was it just in trying to figure out what art was that you were just like trying stuff out and then realized, oh, I like this better, or? Yeah, it was, um, it, it was, a, it was a journey. Uh, like I said, that question sent me down a uh, rabbit hole, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of followed me around like one of those clouds in a cartoon that's mm -hmm. like raining on you, like yeah. it was with me everywhere I went. Uh, and uh, I had a friend, uh, this young lady, her name was Quashelle Curtis. Mm -hmm. uh, she had grown up, like me, wanting to be an artist, but she grew up in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, so she had gone to LaGuardia, and she was like, mm -hmm. when she came as a freshman in school, she was already showing in galleries and stuff like that. Wow. Uh, she was amazing. 
amazing painter. Uh, and, you know, uh, we became best friends, like, instantly. But uh, she used to always come to my room. She'd be like, those cartoons you're drawing are cute and shit, but come with me to this museum, mm -hmm. you know? And I had never been to a gallery or a museum in my life, mm -hmm. you know, uh, before I got to college. Uh, and she would literally drag me by my hand through the high museum, uh, <laughs> drag me across the ta uh, across Atlanta to galleries and stuff like that. Uh -huh. This artist is doing this, and this painting is this style, and this is this medium, and this is this, and this is that. And, like she was giving me this, you know, like like you know, quick and dirty on the ground education about mm -hmm. art. And you know, eventually I stopped drawing my cartoons in in my uh, sketchbooks, and mm -hmm. I started painting my cartoon characters. Right? Uh, because she was encouraging me to paint, you know, and try out the mediums. And of course, I was also being encouraged to do these things in school as well. Yeah. Uh, I started taking a painting class at Spelman mm -hmm. uh, with Arturo Lindsay. Uh, and, um, you know, Arturo similarly was like, yeah, these, these cartoons are cool, but uh, what, what are you trying to say, you know, mm -hmm. with your artwork? Right? Yeah. yeah, you got talent, but what are you saying with this? Mm -hmm. you know? And so he was the first person to make me like paint big. So he was like, yeah, this is these things you got in your sketchbook there, they're cool. Mm -hmm. But what would it look like as a six foot painting? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Uh, and so then I'm like painting now like large canvases and stuff like that. And again, just exploring, experimenting, uh, and trying different things. Mm -hmm. uh, but my junior year, uh, uh, Goody Mob dropped there album so mm -hmm. right this uh good mob uh, was this was their debut album mm -hmm. and uh everybody's talking about soul food this is like their jokes right so i got the album it's close to thanksgiving time i'm in my dorm room listening to this album and they have a song in there called guess who mm -hmm. where each one of the guys in the group talks about the impact that their mother's love have, has had on them mm -hmm. and how their mother's love saved them from you know self-destruction yeah self uh, i lost my own mom when i was four years old and so the way that they talked about the power of that love really resonated with me because even though I didn't have my mom in the physical, I always felt her hand in everything that I was doing, you know? Whenever I was about to go do something stupid, some stranger or somebody would come along and like kind of say something mm -hmm. that would, you know, put me right back on track. And I always yeah. felt my mom in those moments, you know? So I, I must have listened to that song for hours on repeat. You know, and while it was on, I had this box, this like wooden concrete mold that they uh, would make like bricks and things from on a construction site, right? Mm -hmm. I had this thing in, in the corner of my room. I had picked it up one day because it, it just was interesting to me. It had like cool yeah. textures and stuff on it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I started working with this box. And when I came out of whatever thing I was in, whatever mm -hmm. zone I was in, in front of me, I had converted this box into like what I call the spirit box that was dedicated to my mom. So it's this mm -hmm. sort of abstract representation of my mom's like, head and body. Mm -hmm. And where the torso was, was like a womb, and it was like this old picture of me and my siblings, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and it just, after I finished it, I just kind of sat it in the corner. And people kept coming by, you know, my room, yo, what's that? That's amazing. Like, what are you doing with that, you know? Yeah. And I didn't really have an answer for it. But it, 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 it got me uh, uh, to, to think about, you know, uh, the night that my mom was killed, you know, me and my siblings were all there, and, you know, we had never talked about it mm -hmm. to anybody. With the, not even amongst ourselves, we never spoke about it. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't even remember or tell if what I remembered from that night actually happened or mm -hmm. if I dreamed it or whatever. Anyway, uh, it sent me down another sort of rabbit hole, right? So now I'm chasing this story and like trying to figure out like what happened, who my parents were, and like all this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And when I when I went uh, back to visit family for Thanksgiving, all of my siblings were there, and it was a rare occasion that we're all in the same place mm -hmm. at the same time. So I asked them to write down what they remember from that night, mm -hmm. and they wrote down their versions of, of that uh, night. And it was the first time that I realized one that what I remembered was quite accurate, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, but two, I also got to see what that scene looked like from each of their perspectives. Yeah. And I used their stories to build a body of work that became my ex my senior exit exhibition, right? Uh -huh. So every graduating senior has to do like some kind of a show. Uh -huh. uh, 
And you know, for you know, an entire year, I worked on this project, like creating objects and creating pieces, and you know, things all you know, in conversation with this, this story. And my exhibition was an installation that recreated the brownstone apartment in, in Brooklyn, where we lived the night that my mom died. And the images on the walls were images that were based on the stories that my siblings told about what they remember. Um, anyway, when when that show was installed, uh, the night of the opening, like hundreds of people were there. And, you know, um, I remember watching people look at the artwork and like, break down crying. And, you know, people were coming over to me and saying things like, "Yo, man, I haven't spoken to my brother in 17 years because we had an argument, and your work makes me want to reach out to them and wow. you know mend that wound." Or or uh, someone else's, I was abused as a child, and your work gives me the courage to approach that. And you know, like all these really like intimate, powerful things yeah. that people were sharing. Long story short, I, I was standing back watching these reactions and, and, and thinking about these reactions that night, and I realized the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. This is art. Yeah. This is what I want to do. You know, like I want to make art that moves people, that heals people, that helps people. I don't want to just make pretty pictures. Yeah. Right? And that's how I ended up where I am now. Wow. Just wow. Like that is like beautiful and touching and amazing. And you know, like I've, I've talked to a bunch of artists over the past like, you know, a couple of months and it's interesting to hear all their stories as to you know, how they got into the business and I have never heard that. Nothing like that before. Are there pictures of this online? Of that exhibition? Uh huh. No. Yeah. This is 1997. So wow. it's, <laughs> do you have any pictures in your computer? Of that exhibition? No. no pic do you have any of the work? Do you have that box still? I do have the box. Can you send us a picture of the sure. box? Mm -hmm. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah, because we need to include that. Because yeah. that was the start. Yeah, yeah. It lives on my altar at home. Wow. Yeah. That's mind blowing. Yeah. So then, like, did the recognition from that sort of, like, you know, I don't know, help you? I guess help build a reputation to, you know, help make this viable as a full-time career? Or? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that exhibition, you know, opened a lot of doors uh, for me to, to, to make connections with the Atlanta arts community, um, which was really pivotal, right? Uh, because I was graduating college at that point. And, um, the four years that I have been at the Atlanta College of Art, I rarely left the Woodruff Art Center on play. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really know the city. Yeah. Um, but like, for example, um, Ed Spriggs was at my exhibition, mm -hmm. you know, at that exhibition that I mentioned before. Yeah. And at the time, Ed Spriggs was the director of the Hammonds House. Uh -huh. um, and the Hammonds House had a program that was sponsored by Seagram's Gen, which was like an artist in residency program. So they would have these artists, uh, they, would, they would bring in artists uh, to do a residency. That artist would do a show, but they would also curate a show uh, that celebrated like black artists uh, at the Hammond's house. And so my first show outside of school was at the Hammond's house. Um, and you know, it was, a, uh, it was great, uh, you know, again, just to kind of make those connections and to begin to build those relationships, but it really didn't go much further than that. You know, um, the work that I was doing was not—it was—it was powerful work, mm -hmm. I would say, but it wasn't commercial. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Um, and you know, at the time, that wasn't even really like a necessarily a big concern because I was, in many ways, working through, you know, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, but anyway, after graduating. Uh, college, I needed a job. Yeah. And, you know, painter is not, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like something you can apply for. So yeah. um, I ended up lying on an application and said that I knew how to do graphic design. Nice. I had never taken a graphic design class in my life. They can tell you about <laughs> <laughs> uh, But I ended up getting that job and I worked there for a few months and then I got fired, oh. uh, which was probably a blessing because <laughs> I hated that job. Uh, but um, around that time, I was also, you know, ready to leave Atlanta. You know, like the art world was in New York. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, you know, had family in New York. Yeah. I was like, I'm going 
to New York to make it. <laughs> uh, so I left Atlanta and I moved to New York and I got a job uh, working at this like boutique uh, agency doing graphic design for like up and coming hip hop labels and rap artists and stuff like that. And it was, it was actually pretty dope. It was, a, it was a really, really fortuitous experience mm -hmm. in that it changed the way that I thought about visual culture. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so at that job, I, I literally got to sit like this with like mm -hmm. Puff Daddy and Busta Rhymes and Most Def and you know artists like that and yeah. design collateral for them for their albums and promos and concerts and things like that you know wow. um, uh, and I got to meet the actual person mm -hmm. as opposed to the persona yeah you know and I just remember reflecting on that, like thinking like, man, this is just kind of dope. Like, I wonder what would happen if someone marketed a visual artist the same way we do rap artists. Mm -hmm. You know, would people respond to them the same way? Yeah. File that in the back of my mind. I worked at this uh, spot in New York for about a year and some change. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, all this time though, I'm like making work and I'm trying to get my stuff in galleries and I'm sending out packages and stuff like that. Nobody's calling me back. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm getting frustrated, but I keep going. Uh, at the same time, my homeboy, uh, Salah Anase, who's a DJ here in Atlanta, mm -hmm. uh, we had been, you know, become really uh, close friends before I left Atlanta and he and I started talking about what if we start our own graphic design company mm -hmm. uh, in Atlanta because at that time, I didn't know anybody who was doing anything like what I was doing in New York mm -hmm. in Atlanta. And I yeah. was like, yeah, I can be a big fish in a small pond in, yeah. you know, in Atlanta. So we worked it out. I ended up moving back to Atlanta and we started a company called Diamond Lounge, um, mm -hmm. which was like doing the same kind of thing I was doing in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and one of our first uh, clients was Shirley Franklin. And when she was running for mayor, uh, for her inaugural term. Yeah. Uh, and uh, her uh, team would come in to get collateral and stuff done. Mm -hmm. And they had this line, you had to put this line on all of the collateral that said, paid for by the committee to make Shirley Franklin mayor of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And the team was adamant about this line. Like sometimes it'd be like, put the line first and then design everything else around it, right? Okay. And I'm like, I need, a, I need a team that rocks for me like this. Uh, and as a joke, I, I, I made up you know, this campaign that was uh, partially informed by this experience working with Shirley Franklin's team, mm -hmm. but also uh, coming out of my frustration with trying to get my work in front of galleries because yeah. nobody was calling me back. So I'm like, well, maybe they're not calling me back because they can't pronounce my name. Let me do something that's going to make my name stand out yeah. You know, when they see the stuff come across the desk. But also at the same time, uh, uh, 50 Cent, you know, was just coming out with his first album. Mm -hmm. And everywhere you looked, there was a 50 Cent promo, mm -hmm. right? You were walking down the aisle in the grocery store, he's on all the cereal boxes. Mm -hmm. You open any magazine, he's in there, billboards, mm -hmm. he's on the back of the church fan, like, you know, <laughs> everywhere you looked, there's a 50 Cent hat. And I was just like, man, this, this dude is ubiquitous. Like, I, 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 I want to do something like this. Mm -hmm. And so, as a joke, uh, I made up this campaign, Fahamu Paku is the shit. And, of course, it was paid for by the committee to make Fahamu Paku officially the shit. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and there was really no rhyme or reason to it. Yeah. I just wanted to see what would happen. And this, again, goes back to that question about what would happen if somebody marketed a visual artist like they do a rap artist. Mm -hmm. So the whole Fahamu Paku is the shit thing was like, everything that I was doing for my rap clients, I did for myself as a visual artist. Uh, and so I started doing like these posters, these wee pastings all over the city. Mm -hmm. I would do the shit. I did stickers. I put them up everywhere. I made T-shirts. I gave them out to people that uh -huh. were wear. And instant, like people were like, who's who? What is? What does this even mean? That is you the so shit. Clever. What is that even talking about? Like you know that kind of thing. And then for me, it was a joke. I just wanted to see if people would actually uh -huh. react to it. And I mean, it was crazy. Like people were all over it. Like wow. Uh, this is also during a time of like, this way before your time, but mm -hmm. websites like Black Planet and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what was the other one? MySpace. And, I've heard of MySpace. Yeah. Uh, 
And so I started doing, you know, before there was such thing as social media campaigns, like social media campaigns. So like I would create fake profiles uh -huh. uh, for people that would be like, yo, man, have y'all heard of Fahamu Paku and shit? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and just, you know, like pepper every space that I could with, with, with wow. this kind of thing. And again, just to kind of see what would happen. So it was all experimental. It was always like tongue in cheek. It was like poking fun of like popular culture and celebrity and all this kind of thing. Uh, and ultimately, it started making its way into my artwork. Right? Uh -huh. uh, uh, when I first started it, there was no connection between my artwork and the campaign. Mm -hmm. It was just the campaign, mm -hmm. and then my artwork was something completely different. Yeah. Um, what I didn't mention was, uh, because I, you know, like I said, I never studied graphic des design or took any design classes. Mm -hmm. I taught myself how to do graphic design by studying magazines. Like I would go to bookstores and just buy all the cool magazines and like flip through them and mm -hmm. oh that looks dope and I try to recreate it and just kind of teach myself like how to mm -hmm. use the, the software and stuff. Um, so I had, by this time I had developed a really, really healthy obsession with magazines. Like mm -hmm. you know, stacks and stacks and stacks of magazines. And so I would always just go to the bookstore two, three times a week and just mm -hmm. buy magazines. Um, one day I'm in there picking up some magazines and the subscription cards that you find in there, one of them fell out. And usually I just leave it on the ground and just keep them. Yeah. Um, but this day, there was somebody on this cover for a, a forthcoming issue that I didn't know. And I was like, man, when you see somebody on the cover of a magazine, you automatically think it must be somebody important. They're on the cover of a magazine. Yeah. I should be on the cover <laughs> of a magazine, right? So <laughs> I made up a magazine called Contemporaneo. Uh -huh. uh, which means contemporary Spanish, and mm -hmm. I put myself on the cover, and I made this like fake subscription card mm -hmm. for a forthcoming issue with me on the cover. Yeah. And it said, if you fill this in and mail it back, you'll get a free issue of Contemporary Neo featuring Bob, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then I went back to all the bookstores all over town, and I put these cards in magazines, you know, mm -hmm. all of the other newsstands. I, again, I just wanted to see what would happen, right? Mm -hmm. If people would actually like respond to it. They came back by the hundreds. Like people were mailing these cards in, requesting this magazine, uh, and I just thought it was funny, right? <laughs> one day I'm at my mailbox. I open the mailbox and there's a stack of cards in there, and I'm looking at this cover that I mocked up. Uh -huh. I'm like, this is kind of dope. I should paint this. And that's how it all started. Wow. I love that. I love that <laughs> so much that you were just like, you know what? I'm just going to hype myself up until people start hyping, hyping me up. Like, that is so clever. Y'all. <laughs> That's a pro tip right there. <laughs> this is really a pro tip. That is fake it till you make it, like, to the... Hundredth degree. Infinity power. My mind is blown right now. Like I You, like, say. impostered your way to fame. <laughs> But you know, it, and it's, it's 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 an interesting thing too because it's you know people always say things like uh, if you have a a desire for something, mm -hmm. act as if you already have it, right? Yeah. Like, and the universe will provide. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that uh, foresight or that awareness when I was doing it. I was just experimenting. Like for me, I was more of a thing of I wonder what would happen if. You know what I mean? Like that was my motivation. Like, yeah. what if I do, or uh, why not do? You know what I mean? Like that. So I, I, I literally just kind of wanted to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and so I wasn't even trying to fake it till I make it. I wasn't doing any like. I just was curious. You know, uh, and yeah, I mean, it, it, it ended up being a, a, a really uh, fun, but also sort of profound experiment on uh, on socializ socialization right yeah. like how we're how we're taught or conditioned mm -hmm. to think about certain kinds of things right yeah. uh, and that was the thing that really captivated me about like the hip hop artists that I was working with because again like more often than not the the, the person is very different than the persona mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying yeah and it was like we're 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 being told that you know this particular rap like we're we're told Fifty Cent is this you know tough. Fifty Cent is one of the most astute 
businessman ever, mm -hmm. ever. You know what I'm saying? You see it in his continued, you know, success, uh, success right? Yeah. Like he he's, he was very aware of his uh, physicality and his mythos, mm -hmm. you know, about being shot nine times and how all of those things were like uh, so sensational, mm -hmm. right? That people wanted to buy that story, so he played that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Same with Tupac, right? Like Tupac understood that people love this thug hard persona. Mm -hmm. You know, he couldn't come out and be like, yes. My favorite musical is Les Miserables. <laughs> you know, I write poetry, <laughs> right? Because his vessel, a black male body, mm -hmm. people can only accept it in a certain kind of. Then you can introduce them into mm -hmm. other things once you get, you know, yeah. once they bought into you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that was all. That that was fascinating to me. Yeah. So I, I just kind of did the same thing, like, right? you know, in, in in my early works with the magazine covers was 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 doing that, right? Yeah. It was like, people expect me to be a certain thing because I'm a black man, mm -hmm. right? So let me give you what you think, but I'm gonna also flip it around and show you that there's more to it than this, mm -hmm. right? And so all of those early magazines were, was high satire, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the cigars and the entourage and the bodyguards and all that kind of stuff like that, like, was really about playing with people's uh, uh, prejudices and expectations, mm -hmm. you know, uh, marketing myself as a visual artist through the lens of like hip hop celebrity mm -hmm. made what I was doing more palatable, right? So it was like, yeah, I could come out with this stuff, but people would, would highly reject that because it didn't fit with their preconceived ideas mm -hmm. about my identity. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I bugs bunny them. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I guess that sort of segues into something that I was thinking about. So like in like in this reference behind you, mm -hmm. you're Panther sagging and that's like it's a sort of a loaded issue, especially within the black community. Is that sort of about the, you know, this is what I know that you're gonna see about me, so I'm gonna give that to you with a twist? Yeah, or exactly. uh, you know, and it, it, like so as you know, my my, my work is uh, it's focused on uh, um, deconstructing notions of black male identity, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and humanizing us uh, in, in ways that other aspects of our culture don't allow for. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, it's almost like a Trojan horse, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I have to deliver it like a Trojan horse. Like, if I came out the gate, like, no, it should be, you know, yeah. like, mm. <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm saying? So, I, I do it in a way that, that looks familiar enough that it draws you in, yeah. but once you get there, you realize there's much more to it yeah. than, than what's on the surface. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So I, the camera, I don't know if the camera can see this bit, but uh, over there you have say, the piece that said um, the ways of white people. Why is he sitting on gas? gas it was actually, uh, uh, it's, it's not a gas can. Um, it's a jug, like a, well, you can't see that. Um, but uh, throughout the African continent and other places in the diaspora, uh, you know, where people don't have access to like fresh water and you know things like that, mm -hmm. like they have to have these like huge jugs that they carry. Like they go to the place where they can get their water and they fill it up and blah blah blah. I, I, I like them because I think they are, um, you know, they, they of course point to you know the diaspora in a kind of way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also like the shape of them, I like the color of them, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So I like playing with, 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 with objects like that. Uh, in, in these more recent works, I'm often pulling in references that, uh, uh, that also connect black American identity mm -hmm. to the diaspora, right? Mm -hmm. So it might be things like these, like, you know, jugs, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but it may be like an African mask, or it may be like shells, or it may be like jewelry, or like things like that, like, yeah. you know, fabrics and things like that, uh, that, that connect us to the broader diaspora. So this, uh, this series is called Trapidemia. 
and my, my early paintings were on the covers of magazines, mm -hmm. right? And art magazines specifically yeah. was about the fact that we didn't exist in those spaces. Mm -hmm. How did you get your piece on Blackish, and how has that changed your collector base in America? More and more, like, entertainers were like, all right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and so that changed a lot of the conversations that people were having about and with uh, Black artists. And you said you were in France a lot. Do you have a big audience in France? We, you know, I, I started my own museum now, a dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, African diaspora art. How many did he give you? He just gave me that one, but he has two more. They're just so heavy and hard to move. So. Yeah. Uh, but I'm going to go back and get another one. I really, I'm so tempted to sit in it. <laughs>